Welcome back to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. This is a place where I explore cutting edge methods to enhance our health and well being. And I am your host, Brittany Ford. Thrilled that you are joining today. If you're new, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. I'm so excited that you are here. Today's episode is all about intermittent fasting, but also not just intermittent fasting, fasting in many different ways that we can do it to enhance our health. So I have Dr. Naomi Perella on the show. She is a physician and she is actually the chief medical officer at Zero. And Zero is an intermittent fasting app, basically. I've used it before. It's really helpful if you are fasting frequently. And also just really helpful as a visual to know how long you've been fasting for, how long your eating window is, tracking it, everything like that. So I, yeah, I love Zero. I've used it many times and I recommend it. My mom fasts a lot actually. And so she uses the app, you know, she kind of does the whole 16-8 method and she, she loves it. It really helps give her that visual cue and like keeps her on track. But more than fasting, we get into metabolic health. And we also talk about the different types of body fat and what those are. So not just the fat that you might see on your love handles or your belly or your thighs, but also like brown fat and what does that mean and and what is it actually useful for and how much should we have and things like that. So this one is really interesting. We talk about metabolic flexibility. How do you know if you're in a fat burning state versus a glucose burning state? And how can we kind of optimize both of those for whatever performance, peak performance that we're looking for? It was really interesting. I learned a lot in this one. And I think you will too. Yeah, there's definitely some golden nuggets in this. So enjoy it. But before we dive in, let's do DM of the day. So this is a segment. It's really quick. I just really like to highlight the people who pop into my DMs and give me love and feedback and ask me health questions. So if you ever have any questions, you can do that on Instagram. That is where I am the most active and will respond to you. And obviously I keep everything anonymous. This person writes, hi, Brittany. I just wanted to say how much your podcast on biohacking has changed my perspective on health. Your episode on nutrient-rich foods gave me the push I needed to revamp my diet. Any chance you'll cover more about adaptogens in the future? Thank you for the great info and inspiration. Nice. I love this. I, I wonder if she's talking about a episode I did a few months ago. Wow. It was probably in the spring and it was a deep dive into nutrition of what we should be eating, what we shouldn't be eating type of idea, whole foods, nutrient dense diet. What does that look like? What does that mean? What do processed foods look like now? Ultra processed foods. And it was a solo episode. It was really long. <laughs> But it was a really like foundational episode. So I will link that if you want to listen to that. I really recommend it. So she's probably talking about that one. And yes, cover more about adaptogens. I've definitely done episodes on adaptogens in the past. I don't know if I've done one recently that's like solely adaptogens, what they are, the different kinds. I think adaptogens in general are very like well understood at this point, I would argue. But I also think that maybe we only kind of understand the basics of them. It's kind of like everyone knows what ashwagandha is and that's like the most popular adaptogen and everyone kind of takes it and adds it to their coffee or chocolate or whatever it might be. But there are so many adaptogens out there that we can really utilize to help create harmony within the body and balance our hormones. Things like rhodiola, maca, there's a bunch of different ones depending on what you're looking for. So yeah, maybe that is something that I should do is like a deep dive into plants and herbs and adaptogens and how we can use them. I will definitely take note of this. And thank you for your feedback. I'm happy that I have been able to help you kind of revamp your diet. It's kind of what I'm here for. And I'm glad that I am able to inspire you. A shout out to Nuchito. My gosh, you guys, I got so much good feedback a while ago from this podcast I did on NAD. I got asked this many times actually this year of like, please do a podcast episode on NAD, how it works in the body. You know, what is it all about? Everything like that. So I did one, I think it was in June. So definitely go check that out. 
And there's actually another one coming in September that I'm doing. But the one in June is all about the basics of NAD. What is the molecule? How does it impact aging, longevity? Why does it decline as we get older? How do we increase the levels? What are my thoughts on NAD IV drips? And like, do they actually work and supplements and things like that? And it was a very like well-received episode with Dr. Nicola. And I would definitely listen to that if you are interested. So she has a company called Nucido, And essentially it is a blend of ingredients that helps to increase the specific pathways that cause the decrease in NAD. So what I love about this is she really looked at the root cause of declining NAD. So it's not just like, hey, here's some precursors that might make more NAD and might not. It was like, no, no, no. What is actually causing that NAD decline? Okay, it's actually related to these cellular processes. Okay, now let's work on those, which will then work on NAD. That's what Nucido does. That is why it's the only NAD supplement that I take and why I recommend it to everybody. So definitely check that out. Also, I just love other women in the biohacking space, women-founded companies. Like I'm here for it. I'm here to support them 100%. And she is brilliant. She's very smart. So definitely check out Nucido. Use my discount code so you can save. I take three to six a day and really, yeah, really like them. And a shout out to Bioptimizers. They are doing a free magnesium summer It's really cool. Essentially, like they are giving away free magnesium for the summer. And this ends at the end of August. So be aware. You can get a free bottle of magnesium. And this is awesome. It's a 14 day supply. You get to try it out and see if you feel look better, essentially. Magnesium is is associated in over 300 different processes in the body. So we really want to ensure our levels are optimal. Things like improving mood, sleep, If you have muscle soreness, muscle cramps, anything like that, magnesium is so pivotal. So I take one in the morning and one at night, typically. Sometimes I'll take two at night, kind of depends on the rhythm that I'm in. But I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't take this magnesium, to be honest. So check it out. Use the link in my show notes or on my website. I think it's on my website. Yeah, that's the only way that you can get the free bottle. And I would really recommend you do that so that you can try it out. Okay. Enjoy this podcast episode. I know you're going to get a lot out of it. And if you have any questions, like I said, I am most active on Instagram and that is what I'm here for. So happy to chat and happy to connect with you always. Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I am so excited that you are joining me today. I am joined by Dr. Naomi Perella, who is a physician with a bicultural background and a distinguished career that spans across continents and cultures. As the medical director at Rush Center for Weight Loss and the chief medical officer at Zero, the world's most popular fasting tracker and metabolic health app, I've actually used it many times, that she has helped over 10,000 patients achieve healthier and fuller lives. So today we are going to dive into metabolic health, the power of intermittent fasting. We're also going to talk about the different types of body fat, which I haven't covered on my show yet. And we are going to talk about fasting for women and how that can look different, but still effective. So Dr. Naomi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Brittany. I'm so thrilled to join your audience. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to have you. So how did you kind of get into this metabolic intermittent fasting space? Like how did your career kind of turn towards that area? That's a great question. So the career trajectory just sort of happened. So so when I first decided to go to medical school, I already had children and so already had had some experiences with the medical profession from a patient side and also being a mom. And I went into medical school planning to be a sub-subspecialist and I was going to do all this research in the brain. And as I was going through and taking care of people, I became very interested in just the way people live their lives. And and there were so many different ways people did this and their generational effects and so on. So I started seeing patterns and I decided to shift my focus 
to family medicine, which allows us to look at people both healthy and unhealthy at all ages, you know, from prenatal care, delivering babies, children, adults, old age, and dying. And along that journey, you start seeing there's different patterns of living and thinking about life that result in different kinds of effects in families and in lifespan. And so I really, you know, over time, just my interest and focus started shifting. I had grown up in Japan, so I had seen a different way of getting healthcare and thinking about health. And so just having multiple different perspectives, I kind of brought it into my family medicine practice and just observed, and it became increasingly obvious, there's a lot of things we can do that can change our outcomes. And so I sort of cruised into this space. I started out in primary care. Patients started doing really well with their lifestyle factors and losing weight and getting more energetic and so on. Subspecialists started noticing. They started referring patients to me. My practice became a weight loss and lifestyle medicine clinic. And, you know, fast forward, here I am at Rush doing that. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Interesting. The lifestyle aspect that you focus on, like I I feel like that's kind of not where people typically start when they think like weight loss clinic, you know, you think like dieting and nutrition and like supplements. I guess like what factors within the lifestyle category do you touch upon that you think are most important when it comes to weight loss? Yeah. So when it comes to weight loss, if you think about it, weight is sort of a manifestation of the balance of your body and what you're doing, right? Whether you're intending to or not. And so this is a really, really fun area because everything that's non-medication related that you do in your life affects your body. It signals to your body and tells your body what's going on. And some of us are very deliberate in how we do that. And some people haven't been taught like these things result in this outcome, right? So what ends up happening is your body starts showing you what your choices are signaling to your body. And so lifestyle, the way I think about it is it's all the stuff that you do that you get a choice about, whether it's sleep, relationships, stress management, physical activity, and not being sedentary, the foods you put in your body, how hydrated you are, what you use to hydrate your body, right? All of those factors have an impact. They change your hormones, they change your brain chemistry, they change your gut microbiome, and they allow you to have the kind of life that is the result of that. And so the more and more we can understand it, which is kind of, I think, what you're doing, right? You're helping people connect the dots so that they can get the results they want by making really great choices. Absolutely. Yeah, I I think you're spot on. It's the little choices that kind of like add up day in and day out, but it's it doesn't make it any easier, to be honest. Like even when you say that, like the little choices, it still can be really difficult for people to choose to, you know, go for a walk in the morning sunlight versus like sit on their phone while they drink their first cup of coffee. Like seems like such a simple thing for them to do, but that kind of sets the tone for the day and can like cascade into other healthy choices that they make. So, you know, when you have people come into your clinic or you talk to patients, how do you kind of encourage them and like, I guess like educate them on the power of these little decisions? You know, Brittany, that is such a great point. So, you know, there's so many ways to achieve health and the body is super resilient and the body wants to heal, repair, and thrive. So when we know that, while some things may seem really small to me or you or somebody else, it might be a really big deal for somebody else. And I think the important thing to remember is each person has something that's relatively low-hanging fruit for them that they could tackle, manage, and they could make that massive difference. So it's different. So so some people are not morning people and they want to sit around and have their coffee in the morning. So they might not do the walk in the morning. They might find something else that's really effective later in the day, or they might have to do something in the middle of the day or break it up. There's so many different ways to achieve it. And what's been really impressive and I think one of the benefits when you take care of so many thousands of people, you start seeing there's lots of ways to achieve health and there's lots of ways to 
create new and better habits. And sometimes at the beginning, the morning walk isn't possible, but maybe a year from now, after some other changes ripple through life, that it does become possible, right? So I think, a, you know, one of the things I get frustrated with is when we assume just because something's not possible at one time, that doesn't mean for that person it's impossible forever, right? It means at that moment, that's the, the barrier to entry is a little bit high, but that means there's something else that you could tackle. I agree. It's, I think it's about like meeting people where they are. Totally. Rather than like just trying to get them to be 100% in, two feet in, yep. you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's like, let's start really small. And that can be really hard. Like, you know, I think of, you know, for example, my dad, who's like, you know, struggling with his weight and is so stubborn. And like, we have all, we have all of these, you know, things to work through. And I talked to him about fitness and it's like so basic, right? Like he's like, he's like, oh, I went for a walk today. And in my head, you know, initially you think, oh, you only did a walk. Like that doesn't really count. Like that doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? But again, you have to meet them where they are of like, okay, it's better that you did a walk than you did nothing at all. And that walk, like it's still got your heart rate up. And, you know, maybe you are doing like a little bit more every week and like one more kilometer or whatever it is. And then we can talk about like doing more. And so it's, it takes a lot of patience. And especially when you work with patients, like patients or you work with people, it's, it's really, I would love for people to just, you know, work out every day, do a full program, head to toe biohacking, you know, everything, but it's, it's just not possible for most people. Yeah, you know, Brittany, I love that you're so articulating that so well. So the way, you know, I think about it is sometimes, you know, if you look at a five-year-old and you see a five-year-old sitting on the couch, not doing anything, just looking like a lump, you would be worried, right? You'd be like, wait a second, why aren't you climbing a tree? Why am I not telling you to calm down a little bit or, you know, not do all those things? And because they're being so sedentary and so inactive. And we, so we actually worry about children who are not being active. Now, if the same situation occurred and it's somebody who's like 50 years old, 25, whatever, an adult, and they're sitting on the couch looking like a lump, we're like, come on, get out there. You should be at the gym. You should be doing all this activity. And instead of recognizing that in the five-year-old, there's something going on. They might be having had a bad day. Somebody was mean to them. Maybe they feel sick. Maybe something else is going on. But we know that there's something wrong. With an adult, it's the same thing. If somebody doesn't feel like moving, there's something else going on. So what I find is, for example, if I check labs or if I assess certain factors, I can identify, oh my gosh, we got to deal with these other things first. And then this person is naturally going to feel more activated. And we know that humans are designed to move. So when a human feels great and their inflammation is down and they have access to fuel, they move. Like you can't, you can't just sit around doing nothing. So I think it's such a great marker and it's so wonderful to recognize if somebody starts walking, that's a huge step forward because that means they were able to activate. They had something powerful inside of them that could allow them to start moving again. I love that. Are you feeling drained, struggling with low energy, or noticing that your body just isn't bouncing back like it used to? The culprit might be declining NAD plus levels in your cells. NAD plus is a vital molecule found in every cell of your body. It converts nutrients into energy and activates essential cellular processes. But as we age, our NAD plus levels naturally decline, leading to reduced energy, slower recovery, and overall poor cellular health. Stresses like intense workouts, disrupted sleep, and alcohol can make this decline even worse. But thankfully, there is good news. I love to use Nuchito Time Plus. This is a breakthrough NAD supplement designed to combat these issues. I actually get asked all the time what NAD supplement I use, and this is the one. It is backed by a patented formulation and clinically proven in a double-blinded studies. Nuchito Time Plus targets the root causes of NAD plus decline. It uses advanced science to boost your NAD plus levels, 
supporting better energy, faster recovery, and enhancing overall health. I have an exclusive offer just for my listeners, and you can use code BIOHACKINGBRITTANY at checkout to get 10% off of your order. Don't let declining NAD levels hold you back any longer. Elevate your health and unlock your full potential with Nuchito Time Plus. Remember, that's code BIOHACKINGBRITTANY for 10% off your order. Take charge of your cellular health today. I, I think you're I think you're spot on. When it comes to this idea of metabolic flexibility, I know I feel like that's such kind of like a buzzword right now. <laughs> like people are talking about it. But I feel like we don't really understand most people might not necessarily understand what that means and how it actually impacts like achieving optimal health. Can you kind of break it down a bit for us? Absolutely. This is one of my favorites. So metabolic flexibility is, I agree, it's kind of like a buzzword. And what we're really talking about is that you have your body and all the cells in your body has the ability to burn any of the fuel that's available at that moment. And so some people have a lot of metabolic flexibility, meaning wherever they are, whether or not they eat, they they feel great and they have enough energy because the body can tap into different stores of fat, whether it's the food that you just ate, whether it's the fat on the body that provides fuel, whether it's the stored glucose in the muscles called glycogen. So if your body can use glucose, glycogen, or fat for fuel, you have metabolic flexibility. So it means your your body is secure. It can do what it needs to do. You're going to have infinite energy. Now, if you do not have metabolic flexibility, and you might have heard the term metabolic syndrome, this is a situation where the body is not able to utilize fat for fuel very easily. So commonly, this would mean that you can really gain weight really easily around the waistline. It would affect things like fertility, blood pressure, triglycerides, the cholesterol panel, right? Those would be factors that mean your body is really struggling when it starts running low on glucose fuel, the blood sugars, and it cannot easily tap into the fat cells. And the fat on the body is intended to be our largest reservoir of fuel. So if you can't use fat for fuel, then you only have a small amount of fuel available to you at any time, and then you're going to get the munchies or you're going to need to go eat something. So metabolic flexibility means you have access to all the fuels on your body and you will have lots of energy to do the things you need to do, including all the repair, making the happiness, you know, hormones and neurotransmitters and so on. Okay. I love that explanation. So I think the obvious question here is like, how do you know? Like, how do I know if I'm able to tap into both or I'm somebody who is only able to tap into glucose? glucose? Like, are there signs and symptoms that are very easy for me to see and understand? Absolutely. So let's talk about what people could identify on their own without seeing a doctor or getting blood work done. So you could definitely tell if you wake up in the morning and you are not hungry and you kind of could not eat in the morning, you, you are already having metabolic flexibility. So you have some metabolic flexibility there. You are burning fat at that time, right? Because you didn't eat overnight. And so you can say, oh, well, my body got into fat burning. So I'm a fat burning machine this morning, and that's why I'm not hungry, okay? Another thing you can look for is during the day, if let's say you eat something and then you feel like your blood sugars crash a couple of hours later or even an hour later, or you feel like your blood sugars crash when you're, you know, before you eat something. And so you're feeling shaky, your heart feels like it's racy, maybe you're feeling a little sweaty, you're almost like jittery trying to get to some food. That's a sign of metabolic inflexibility because it means that your fat cells are turned off to you. You can't actually burn fat. So you're going to feel jittery. Your, your body's like, go get food or drink that's going to give you fuel now because we're running on empty. Even though you might have extra fat cells on the body, you're like, wait a second, this, you know, my love handles, like, why isn't this just, there's fuel there. Well, if you don't have metabolic flexibility, your body can't burn that. It can't tap into that. And so it's going to drive you to go eat. And unfortunately, a lot of people have been told, oh, you're trying to lose weight. 
cut your calories. Well, that's not helpful because your body's running on empty. Now you're causing a panic in the body, which causes an increase in a hormone that makes us gain even more weight. So it becomes this vicious cycle and it's not a discipline problem. It's about metabolic flexibility. So people who want to feel great and manage their weight, they're going to establish metabolic flexibility, which means you can burn fat. And then you have access to the largest reservoir of fuel on your own body. I love that. That, yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense of being able to use the fat on your body for fuel. And like the idea of people getting like hangry, you know, <laughs> like they're hungry and then they become super irritable and almost like snappy and aggressive or whatever. And they need that food. I feel like that's almost like the metabolic inflexibility because you're just like, it's just now impacting your hormones, which impacts your mood. And like, you know, it kind of takes over. So yeah, that's, that's so interesting. And, you know, if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, like I wake up, I'm hungry. I have to eat every two hours. Otherwise I'm tired. I'm sluggish. And I still have like, you know, fat on my body, whatever, maybe more than they want. How do, how do they switch? Like, how do they say, okay, body, like, let's start using these fat stores instead of me just giving you these calories all day. Like what, yeah, what does that path kind of look like? Yeah, so this is where some metabolic inflexibility for most people is a result of insulin resistance. And your audience might know about this because this is commonly associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. And that basically means you don't have access to your fat cells. So insulin resistance occurs for multiple reasons, but one of the things that results is blood insulin level, and insulin is different than glucose, when the insulin level is very high chronically, you cannot burn fat. You cannot tap into fat cells. You don't have access to this large reservoir of fuel, and that's why with PCOS, it can also lead to infertility right? And challenges getting pregnant because if your body doesn't have access to enough fuel at a regular interval, it's it's not comfortable creating a new human, right? So this is something that is very challenging. So insulin resistance, the good news about it is you can manage it and you can reverse that. And the way we do that, so again, high insulin over time leads to insulin resistance, meaning your body starts ignoring it because it's kind of like, you know, just constantly high. Your body can't continuously respond to insulin. So let me just backtrack. Insulin turns off fat burning so that your body will burn the blood sugars and bring blood sugars down. So insulin's job is to bring blood sugars down. And we know that very high blood sugars is poisonous to the body and that's called type 2 diabetes when it's chronically elevated. So insulin is meant to bring down the sugars. Now, it does that by storing all the sugars in the bloodstream and turning off your body's fat-burning capabilities so that every bit of fuel your body needs, it's going to drop from the sugars, okay? So you can imagine anything that spikes insulin aggravates insulin resistance, and anything that pre prevents insulin from coming down aggravates insulin resistance. So what raises insulin? Sugars, starchy carbs, certain artificial sweeteners, high stress, poor sleep, right? So all of those things, any of those will aggravate. Now, if you want to reverse it, so you want metabolic flexibility, you want to burn fat, you want to reverse this process, you will improve those. So you can improve the sugar in your diet by not having as much or eliminating it. You can reduce the starchy carbs in your diet or be very conscious of when you have it so that you're very deliberate. You might have it at the end of a meal or only at one meal per day. You might decide to eliminate artificial sweeteners. You may decide to improve your sleep and your stress levels, right? So any of those and the more of them you knock out, the better that's going to be. And if you have very high insulin levels, then you'll want to knock as many of them out as possible for at least a period of time until you reverse the disease process. Then you have more flexibility. 
Yeah, I, I love that breakdown. And I, I think it's important to just kind of like look at it through that lens and understand the role that insulin plays. I feel like it can be confusing for a lot of people and and just like misleading. And also, again, like even just talking about the lifestyle factors there, I think is so interesting of like, yeah, we know sugar and like processed food and high carbohydrate foods are obviously going to spike insulin. But now you're saying like stress does and lack of sleep does. And I don't really see people talking about that. Like I don't hear people talking about that. We live in such a, like, especially in North America, we live in such a high, not always, but kind of like high stress, busy lifestyle that it's almost like this good thing when people say like, Hey, how was your week? Oh, it was, it was good. It was okay. It was really busy. You know, like that's kind of what we say now. And it's almost like a badge of honor of like, I worked 60 hours this week or 80 hours this week, you know, but in reality, like what is that actually doing to our metabolic health and leading to like even further, like long-term chronic disease, diseases and issues? Exactly. Exactly. You're right on. So you're right. It's, it's this busyness factor right? People do wear like a badge of honor. In medicine, this is a this has been a huge thing, right? Oh, I, I haven't slept in however many days. Like th- this was a really big thing, especially in my training. And, and one of the things we know is people do better when they have a better balance, right? So I think that's really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I know something that you also talk about that I want to dive into is the different types of body fat. I think this is so interesting because I don't think a lot of people might know that there's different types of body fat and actually that they have different roles in the body. Like what they do functions differently and they're located differently actually in the body as well. So I'd love for you kind of to discuss the various types and how it impacts our metabolic health. Absolutely. So there's really multiple different places where fat can get stored on the body. And the one that most people are aware of and that, you know, most people don't like is what we call the subcutaneous fat. And that's the stuff that's right under the skin, but sitting outside of all of your organs and your muscles, right? So this is the stuff that creates rolls and that you can squeeze, right? This, this fat tissue, people don't like it. They come into my office and they grab, you know, a chunk, a roll, and they say, I want to get rid of this, right? So that's the stuff that everybody's super aware of. That tissue has some effects, such as it can help keep you warm. It's a great insulator, and it can also buffer, like if you bump into things, right? So, and it's mechanically, it can be challenging if you have a lot of it because it's just hard on the joints to carry around extra tissue, right? So, so that's subcutaneous fat. Then there's the fat tissue that's in the liver, and the liver fat is the one that really causes the most disease. And that fat is a very, very small amount. And that you really wouldn't notice a weight change, but you might hear somebody being told they have fatty liver. Their liver enzymes are elevated. They might have an ultrasound of their liver and they're told they have fatty liver. That's unhealthy. In the past, it used to be caused by mostly alcohol, sometimes some medications or drugs. And more recently, it's usually because of excessive amounts of sugar in the diet, specifically fructose, leading to fatty liver. Then there's the what many people are now becoming increasingly aware of called visceral fat. And that's the fat that sits around the organs. So it's under the stomach muscles and it's around all of the organs. And that fat can also be problematic. It causes a lot of inflammation and that can lead to additional problems. So both fatty liver and visceral fat, if you have too much of it, it can lead to metabolic syndrome, right? Or the metabolic inflexibility. It can lead to inflammation throughout the body, type 2 diabetes, PCOS. There's so many things that go along with that. So those are the different categories. There's also different fat cell types So for example, you might know of people who do cold plunges or, you know, get into cold water frequently, whether it's swimming or whatever. The fat cells, those subcutaneous fat cells, then will convert from being sort of that yellow fat that, you know, you might notice like if you're having chicken or something right before you cook it, 
that fat tissue will start becoming more metabolically active, meaning it's going to help your body stay warm when you're regularly submerged into something cold or you live in a cold climate. That fat tissue then will start changing from yellow fat to brown fat. Brown fat is very active because of the mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy producers, right? And they produce heat in the body. If you convert your fat cells to brown fat, it's actually very good, right? Because it's very active. And so hibernating animals will, for example, have brown fat, which can help their metabolism through their hibernation period. If you're feeling out of sync with your hormones or struggling with fertility, I totally get it. I've been there and it can be so frustrating, but I found a delicious way to support your reproductive health. I have developed hormone balancing, fertility boosting chocolate. This isn't just any type of chocolate. It's packed with adaptogens like maca root and antioxidants from cacao and pomegranate. These ingredients can help regulate your hormones and support your preconception health and fertility. You need to download this recipe ASAP, okay? Because it's more than just a treat. It's a powerful way to nourish your body from the inside out. Imagine indulging in a rich, delicious chocolate that not only satisfies your sweet tooth, but also boosts your wellness. Whether you're trying to conceive, balance your hormones, or just crave a healthy indulgence that you get to make from home, where you get to control all of the ingredients and also optimize your health, this recipe is perfect for you. Don't miss out on this tasty, fertility-enhancing, optimizing health solution. You can go to biohackingbrittany.com slash pages slash fertility dash chocolate and download the recipe for free right now. Go for it. It's just right there waiting for you. It's linked in my show notes. It's linked on my website. You're going to find it super, super easy. So treat yourself to better health one delicious bite at a time. I love that. I love that explanation. And I know a lot of people listening love their cold therapy, just like I do. Mm -hmm. So it's just an, it's just another reason to do it is to like totally. convert that fat into being more active. I think that's, I think that's really smart and interesting actually that, that that happens in cold and not, and not anything else. Cause I don't think that happens in heat, right? Like in a sauna, like high temperatures, that same thing is not going to happen. Correct. Correct. So this is for insulating and keeping your body warm, right? So in a song, you actually want to sort of sweat, right? It's it's a little bit different. So yeah, because you're trying to cool down in a sauna. But saunas also have great, you know, therapeutic effects as well. But for the cold, so this is one of the really cool things about swimming. So some people will say to me, you know, well, you know, I I, I do like swimming. And I'm like, oh my gosh, well, if you get in the water, on a regular basis, even if you don't swim, but you just stand in the water, your body has to maintain body temperature. And that's really, really hard to do. And that takes up a lot of energy. So just like it's so expensive to, you know, air condition a home in a really hot climate, because you have to pay for so much energy, it's very hard for your body to maintain body temperature, right? So again, heating, air conditioning costs a lot of money for the same reasons. It uses a lot of fuel. And the same thing happens for humans. If you make your body have to maintain body temperature, it burns fuel. So swimming is one of the ways that you could basically have a good time and simultaneously have a multi-sensory experience, which is so great for the body, and simultaneously burn a lot of calories just because your body has to stay warm in cooler water. Nice. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I, I love that. I'm I'm curious when it comes to men versus women, and we're talking about these different like types of fat. Do you see particular patterns in both men and women? Like maybe women carry more fat in this area or have more of this type of fat due to like fertility or hormones or even before menopause. Like, do you see some sort of pattern there between them? Absolutely. So I mean, women carry more fat than men just at baseline. But well, we have to, and it's it's healthy, right? So, so that's important. Of course, premenopause, perimenopause, and postmenopause are two different things for women, right? Mm -hmm. Men just sort of have for their life, you know, as an adult, if they are gaining weight, they are more likely to gain weight around their waistline, just as as a baseline. For women, 
because we have estrogen premenopause, estrogen actually preferentially lays down fat tissues on the body so that it's more in an hourglass shape, so less around the waist. So somebody might have really, really wide hips and thighs, which many people, you know, complain about, or they might, you know, have large breast tissue depots and and they con- they're concerned about all the excess weight and you know but oftentimes their labs and their metabolism does not demonstrate that there's a problem at that time because it's not around the organs right it would be subcutaneous fat so it's not around your organs in your gut it's not in the liver so much that's helpful right and that's why we see less cardiovascular disease in women when we're younger premenopausally. Now, postmenopause, we lose the estrogen. So now we become like men in the way we lay down fat. And so that's when it starts entering the midsection. So you and I have probably both heard one of the biggest complaints is, oh my gosh, menopause is kicking in or my hormones are off and suddenly I'm gaining weight around my waist. That's, that's what that is. So again, yes, there are differences and it does depend on the hormone balance. And this is one of the really awesome things to know, which we have, you know, essentially known for a long time, but now more and more people are becoming aware. It's that our weight distribution on our body and the weight is all driven by hormones. So if you know how to manage the hormones, you can actually get the result that you're looking for, right? So at certain times in our life, we're more sensitive to certain hormones, and those hormones determine the shape of our body and the weight of our body. And sometimes you can be doing things that might impair your body's ability to maintain the weight that you want to maintain. Yeah, I love that explanation. It's actually interesting you explained it like that. My mother-in-law is <laughs> she doesn't listen to the show, so it's fine. <laughs> but so she, we had this very similar discussion, let's say like two months ago. And she's like, I'm gaining, you know, I've gained weight. I have this like, you know, tire around my belly. She's early 60s. She went through menopause at 56, so a bit later than the average. And, you know, she she's like, I'm gaining weight in new places. And I'm like, I'm sick of it. It's been like two years. Anyway, so she goes on this diet of like low carb, high fat. One day a week is cheat day on Saturdays. So she can eat whatever she wants. And she did all this by herself. Like this was not my recommendation at all. Anyway, so because I would not recommend this type of program in my mind. I don't think it's like sustainable and whatnot. And so for her, and she thinks it's obviously like you're saying, like hormonal and, and that type of thing. But I think so many women get into that trap of like, wow, my body looks so different now postmenopausal. I don't like it. I'm going to do this really restrictive diet and then I'm going to lose all this weight. And now I'm happy with my body, but I, I have to keep eating this way, this low carb, whatever, low calorie, whatever it might be in order to keep this weight off. Like, What would you recommend to those women out there who are struggling with this hormonal weight loss, weight gain, they're kind of like in this repetitive cycle. Yeah, so that is so wonderful. And I can completely appreciate that because, of course, we hear so many people coming in, you know, saying, hey, I, you know, I'm starting to gain weight around my waist. I, this is not how I've been in the past. I don't like this and I'm going to do something extreme. So, and usually it's some kind of severe dietary restriction or change up. You're right. A lot of people will not want to continue to do that. And one of the things I can say is there are many different ways to achieve health and healthy weight loss. And so, you know, anybody who says this is the one and best way, that's that's just not true. It it's absolutely not true. So you're right. So over time, even if somebody uses extreme, you know, dietary restriction or certain pattern for how they're planning to lose weight, they have to have a transition plan because your body adapts. Your body is going to change. It's going to continue to adapt and change. And that is something that most people don't plan. So even if you're doing something super restrictive and you're having wild success, it doesn't last forever, 
right? Because the body changes, the body adapts. And so there's, so I always tell people there's phases. And when you, you know, do something, you're going to do it for a period of time. You may need a transition. You can always come back to what you were doing before and see if that helps you. But you want to be flexible because the human body is meant to adapt. And so you want to be flexible and shift according to what's necessary. So for example, with somebody who's doing very low carb, very high fat diet, that would be like a ketogenic diet. They may or may not continue to do that for a lifetime, but if they want to transition off of that and maintain their weight loss, they're going to need to create a plan that keeps that insulin very low. Postmenopausally, when people pick a diet, let's say it's very low carb, very high fat, otherwise known as like a ketogenic diet, some people will continue that for a lifetime and some people will want to transition off that, whether or not they've achieved their weight loss goals or not. So if somebody wants to maintain whatever success that they've had, let's say some weight loss, then they're going to need a plan of action. And there's more than one way to achieve health and health promoting weight loss. And so the key would be to find patterns that allow that insulin level to be lower. And again, lower insulin means fat burning. And that's what the ketogenic diet does. It lowers that insulin level so that somebody can be in a fat burning state for a longer period of time. Now, the problem with some diets, whether it's a very high carb or very low carb, is if you have zero deviation, so you're 100% compliant for a period of time, your body will change the kind of enzymes that are available for fuel burning. So this is metabolic inflexibility, meaning if you had very high fat diet, low carb diet for a long period of time and you are very consistent with it, you'll lose weight, you'll feel great. If you add in those sugars and carbs again, sometimes the blood sugars skyrocket because the body wasn't prepared for that. It just stopped making the enzymes to manage that, right? So it's sort of not prepared and not ready for the dose of sugars and carbs that it got And so then weight gain can happen very quickly. So you want to create an opportunity for the body to transition. And this is where thinking about nutrition in phases with the ultimate goals in mind. So if you know you're going from a ketogenic diet, very low carb, very high fat diet, and you've been consistently ketogenic for years, you're going to want to transition in a way that doesn't freak your body out because it's not ready for carbs yet. It can, again, your body adapts. It can learn to do that again, but it's going to take a little bit to sort of, you know, sort of bring back in that ability to manage sugars and carbs at the load that you're planning. And again, you may have to pay attention to other factors so that you keep that weight in check. Yeah, I, I love that. My my recommendation to her and like kind of what I said is, and what I would do myself in that phase of life would be I would actually intermittent fast probably most days because I would no longer have a menstrual cycle and I would no longer be concerned about my hormones and fertility. And I'd be able to get all of the cellular benefits from intermittent fasting. So I would definitely do that. And then I would be doing more strength training. She does a lot of like yoga and walking and cardio. And I think that's great. But I think women are prone to bone loss and osteoporosis and different things like that. So, and building muscle helps also burn more calories on a day to day basis. So, like weight training. And then I was also, I would look at bioidentical hormones, adding those in and like understanding their role and how they can support me. And then the last thing I said to her again, and like maybe this would be different once I'm there is I would also bring in more of like a holistic stress stress management kind of practices as well. So like using a sauna and cold therapy, probably like three times a week, just to help with like burning those calories, burning that fat off, but not overstressing myself and trying to make it more holistic in nature. What do you think about like a plan like that in terms of like metabolic health and weight management? Absolutely. So you're crushing like all of the different pillars, right? And so I agree. Intermittent fasting is one of the 
only ways that we know long-term, most sustainable, lowest number of side effects or adverse events can be matched with any kind of medications, pretty much, mostly, right? Other than the ones that really drop your sugars and then you just have to monitor and adjust. So super, super effective, Never mind the autophagy and et cetera. I agree with muscle. That is your, you know, basically your longevity tissue, right? So again, strength training, a lot of people are doing cardio thinking they're going to burn fat, but your muscles actually absorb a lot of the fuels and burn those off, just like you said. And so I agree, muscle, muscle, muscle. And as we get older, and especially postmenopausally, your body is basically going to deplete muscle. And, and that's the tissue that you want to keep the most. I agree absolutely with bioidentical hormones, if that's indicated for the individual and stress management. I think one of the really cool things, and women are really good at this, relationships, right? The more relationships you have that include feeling close with somebody, smiling, laughing, playing, any of those kinds of positive emotions that you can elicit within a relationship is an anti-stressor. So even if you're like, oh, I don't meditate, I'm not doing nature exposure or whatever, but you like to hang out with people, do that because that is super, super powerful. And we know that's directly linked to longevity. So those would be some things that do make a difference. And again, if you're trying to maintain weight loss, it's going to be important that you keep the stress hormones down, especially if you're transitioning diets and you're postmenopausal. Nice. Yep. I agree. Yeah, the social factor is actually huge. Yeah, isolation and feelings of like loneliness, which then leads to like depression or anxiety is, you know, really tough for anybody. But especially as you get older, we really do need that like community around us, whatever that might look like. So I I think that's really smart. I would love for you to touch on intermittent fasting for women of the fertile years. What do you recommend there? Because I have been in the boat of like five years ago, I loved fasting. I did it every single day. And I was like, oh, this is the best. It was like so easy to maintain, kept any weight off. Not that I really even needed to think about that at the time. And then it impacted my menstrual cycle and my sleep. And then all of these things happened. So what do you, what do you recommend? Yeah, that is... Oh, such a good question and brilliant. So again, when you are cycling, your body is going to have different needs at different times of the month, right? And and a lot of people will recognize that. They'll say, you know, I'm going into my period, I'm like starving, ravenous, having weird cravings, and I just want to eat like sugar all day or starchy carbs all day. Totally understandable. So during the pre-menopause years, the years where it's the reproductive years, the fertility years, your hormones cycle in such a way that intermittent fasting for different durations would be important. So at certain times of the month, it's better not to do longer fasts. So 12-hour fast, I think, is appropriate at any time. Like you can do that at any time of the month. But if you are particularly at the times of the month, the first half of the month, there might be time periods when you want to keep your fast shorter. So that would be right around your period and right around ovulation. You definitely want to allow your body to have surges of hormones that are necessary and start rebuilding hormones when your hormone levels are low. So shorter fasts, if you're going to be doing intermittent fasting or basically not fasting at those times would be important. If you are having time periods where you have very high levels of hormone, the hormone estrogen, which is sort of in the later part of that first half of the cycle, first half of the cycle would be after your period, your estrogen levels start climbing and you're going to find that you can do more exercise, you can do HIIT, you can do intensity. Anytime you're feeling that in, you know, like I can do everything, that's a time that you probably could add in some longer fasts. But then again, if you are feeling very hungry, that's not a time to do a fast. You can really listen to your body in this time period. If you're hungry, you should not be like pushing yourself to do extended fasts. You should listen to your body and eat because your body is probably either needing water, salt, 
or protein. So if you have any of those foods, you're gonna be in good shape. If you have carbs, that's fine. If you do it at the end of a meal, especially, it's gonna be a lot easier for your body to manage those carbs. And you can maintain weight, you can cycle, you can do all the things you need to do. But if you're trying to do calorie restriction or because you fast, you eat so much less, that will impact your hormones and your cycling. And your body will say there's not enough, so we should not cycle in a way that we could get pregnant. If there's one mineral you should be worried about not getting enough of, it's magnesium. Magnesium is the body's master mineral. It's powerful and it's involved in over 600 critical reactions, including hormone balance, stress management, sleep quality, even digestion is influenced by the presence of magnesium. But there are two big problems here. One, magnesium has been largely missing from U.S. soil since the 1950s, which explains why it's estimated that up to 75% of the population may be deficient. And two, most supplements contain only one or two forms of magnesium, when in reality, your body needs seven. The only magnesium supplement on the market that has the full spectrum of all seven forms is called Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers. This is my favorite. I've been taking it for over two years. That's why I'm so excited to tell you that I was able to arrange a killer deal for you for this summer. You won't find this deal on Amazon or even on the company's own website. This deal is exclusively for my audience and it's for a very, very limited time and only while supplies last. So right now you can actually get a bottle of Magnesium Breakthrough for free. Like actually you get it for free. I'm not kidding. So go now to my website that they made for me, which is magbreakthrough.com slash biohacking Brittany free and get your bottle of magnesium breakthrough for free today. Again, that's magbreakthrough.com slash biohacking Brittany free and you get it for free. So go now. It's linked in my show notes of this episode and it's linked on my website so you can find it really easily or just DM me and I will send it to you as well. All of us should be on magnesium and this is my absolute favorite one to take. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's like different times of the month that it's better suited for. I I think you can also just bring in more of a simple practice to it of like, you know, two days a week, I intermittent fast. And that looks like, you know, Tuesdays and Fridays and there's days in between there that I don't. But if I ovulate on those days or my period is on those days, then I don't do it. Like, you know, very simple. We don't have to overcomplicate it necessarily. The other thing that I love seeing people do is longer fasts, but less frequently. So say someone does like a 48 hour fast, 72 hour fast once every quarter or something like that. Like, I think those are really powerful and can be a great way to kind of like reset things without this like chronic, like, you know, depletion of nutrients, which has all of these negative side effects long-term. So it's just different. And it'd be nice if we could just, you know, fast for 16, 18 hours every single day and not think about it. But I've been on the other side of that. And so many women have where it's like our bodies are not like men's and we cannot treat them like that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Most men are larger than most women. And so they have a larger reservoir of tissues to draw from, including muscle, right? And so for women, we don't have that luxury of that extra store of bone, muscle, right? So we do have to be a little bit more careful. And we are also you know, having more hormonal shifts and changes in cyclical patterns than men. And so that, you know, really does make a difference. And I I love the idea of like 5-2 or, you know, picking one or two days a week where it might be a little bit longer fast. That works really well in PCOS, for example, when we're talking about the pre-menopause years, because that allows the body to sort of reset at regular intervals. So when you do a little bit longer of a fast, your insulin level can come down further, which, you know, in PCOS, the insulin level tends to be higher to begin with. So it just takes a little bit longer for it to come down. So it's a great way to allow the body to sort of recalibrate and lower that insulin so that it stays insulin sensitive and responsive. So that works really well. Smart. I I, I really love that. If people want to connect with you 
or try your app Zero, which we haven't really talked about, but it's basically a a fasting app that helps you track your fasts, which is very helpful. Like I said, I've used it many times. How can they do that and and where can they go? Yeah, so the Zero app is available on any app store. So if you go to the Apple store, for example, you can download the Zero app. The website, zerolongevity.com, is a great place to see sort of our blog posts. We have a fat burning guide that's also available in our free app. You can just download and it has all the tips and everything for weight loss, fat burning, and how to use fasting to your advantage to get your goals. And then again, I am honestly, I'm brand new in Instagram. So I'm learning how to post and how to do that. But, you know, if somebody messages me, obviously, since I'm so brand new, I will see your message and I will be able to, you know, read any of the comments, any suggestions, anything like that. I cannot give any medical advice directly to a, you know, single individual, but I can definitely, you know, read what people have to say and make some recommendations sort of on a general broad audience kind of a way. Great. I thank you for that. I will put that in the show notes and on my website so everyone can find you easily. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. This was awesome. And I I just really appreciate it. Brittany, thank you so much. And thank you for what you do and how you're sharing such valuable information to so many people. I think those of us women who've, you know, sort of struggled with trying to figure out what's going on and not knowing where to get the information to know that you're out there and you're providing such valuable information. I really appreciate it. It makes our job, especially in medicine, so much easier as well. So thank you for everything you do. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.